And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, the creator of Defenders of the New Century, which is which is no, which is going to be heading into Kickstarter later this month. The one, the one and only Lu, Lewis, not to be confused with Hamilton, J Lewis Johnson. Yes, I, yeah, I don't worry. The other the other famous British Lewis. Hello, <laughs> hello. Pleasure to be back. Pleasure to be back. It's been it's been about a year, but it's still as spacious as I remember. But no, it's uh, it's, it's it's nice to be back. And um, yeah, yeah, everything's coming to Kickstarter soon. Twenty sixth of October. That's the big day, and uh, that one's pretty much set in. Well, I say pretty much it is set in stone at this point. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I'm pretty excited to be honest. It'd be nice to chat about it a bit more and catch up. Yeah. Now we've um we ended up we ended up covering it a it a uh, bit but how how how's the how's the last year been tr been treating you and treating the develop of uh, development of defenders well, as far as like, the years treated me, it's not treated me especially well. I've I've, uh, I've gotten a couple. I've got a diagnosis for ADHD this year, which is explaining all sorts of stuff and um, also some anxiety stuff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But mm -hmm. mental health wise, that was what took up quite a bit of my uh, early part of the year. But I finally got it back on track. As far as how the game is going, the game is uh, better than ever. Uh, the mechanics haven't changed all that much. We've done one deep dive uh, playthrough uh, in over the course of the past year in order to try and improve things. Mm -hmm. Some of the mechanics have changed but by and large the base game is now done at this point and uh, most of the exercises have been in coming up with like you know example content uh, for people to help run the game the GM's guide type stuff just all the accompanying accessories which will be pretty cool and um, uh, just through a various mixture of um, you know I got a graphic designer which was very nice I got Anna um, who recently just finished the Herbalist Primer and I'm very very pleased for her um, and uh, I was glad that I managed to get her on the project as well and um, I other than that, just a variety of delays compounded, but here now, and uh, really pleased with the game. So yeah, that's that's pretty much where it's at, mainly on the uh, peripheral side of things, but good mm -hmm. peripherals. The, the editing and graphic design and all the stuff, which uh, I didn't know how to do at the start of this, but now I do. Yeah, um, it's it is one of, it is one of those things that is a is is a is a learning experience to be sure. Hell yeah! Hell yeah! Oh. Like, it's it's just impossible to know how long these things are going to take. And just, like, there's so many little things that I just didn't anticipate would take as much time as they do. And, like, it feels like they're so innumerable. But even the, even the you know, air quote simple stuff, like, you know, figuring out how tax works, especially in the wake of Brexit, we won't get into that. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, just, just figuring out, like, you know, how the tax is working, who's going to go where, where the books are being printed, the various bits of minutiae. It's, it just takes up time. Absolutely loads of the stuff. No wonder nobody writes these damn books anymore. <laughs> oh. But one, one particular, one, um, I think, I think one particular thing that we should, that we should get into ca to kind of, to kind of, ref to kind of refresh, um, a lot of people's, me a lot of people's, uh, memory since it's been about a year. Reasonably is, so, yeah. Is the, is the, is the kind of tone that you, that you go with, um, Defenders of the New Century. Since, as I, as I recall when you, when we talk, when you talked about it before, um, you're going for a bit of magic and a bit of, um, I'd say, I I I keep I keep it's one of those things where I keep veering between steampunk and diesel punk, but it is very yeah um, yeah yeah it it's very, it, it's very first world war era kind of technology yes it's it's early nineteen hundreds yeah with like occasionally borrowing some bits from later bits but like you know like no tanks or anything like that I mean the whole point of it was just to you know have a setting that plausibly could have people using um uh guns and melee weapons and also sort of like a scientific magic and everything be fairly balanced because no matter how balanced you uh, make your magic system, you know, a machine gun is always going to sort of, like a, like one of the proper later ones are always going to win against, say, for example, like Melee, and it is fundamentally a combat game. So, like, I mean, the weird thing is, is that it does have a genre, it is turn of the century, which, you know, used to be a bit more, but, like, I found it far easier to just kind of say, like, Cthulhu-esque, you know, because, like, that's the sort of time period that people associate these things, because, as you say, it's not, it, it, it's not, 
steampunk, you know, like it's it's fairly grounded apart from the magic, which is un well understood, and like the diesel punk kind of goes a little bit too far into the mecha thing. It's sort of like in that nice sweet spot, you know, where it is primarily steam powered, but at the same time, you know, still fairly grounded was the big thing. It it was weird because um. So much of it has been designed to be as grounded and predictable as possible, so that way the players can actually make effective plans, but then all that gets blown to hell yeah. with the core yeah. gameplay mechanic of making your own superpower. So when, yeah. I, when I pitched when I pitched it to some of my students, I did br I did bring up that um, the kind the kind of uh, the kind of cr the kind of cross generation Gonzo ness that that you t that you tend to see in console style RPGs, and I specifically brought up Wild yeah. Arms as 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 an example with this kind of thing where it's um it's very it's very clear trying to trying to have this that you have this um you have this hodgepodge of, of elements from from di from different um time periods and different subgenres but um the obviously the old west is the primary pillar whereas I'd oh say, yeah i'd say in the, and that's um that's that's actually something so, something that i always find interesting is you look at a, you look at a lot of a lot of the a lot of those console style RPGs. I hate the term JRPG, um, or 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 fa or fantasy works in a lot of manga, and it's not a, it's not a it's not a str it's not a straightforward genre, but more of a con but more of a continuum. Um, yeah. Where you have you have you look at a lot of like if if I want to be if I want to be really pedantic, and I've I've mentioned this on on the podcast, but the only P the only pure fantasy anime I can I can think of that I've seen in I've seen in the last um last thirty years is Record of Lodos War and even that is a stretch. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was gonna. Oh, wait, is that the um? God, I'm trying to think of the one. Is that the one with like the surprisingly realistic combat mixed into it? I'm oh, trying to remember. Rec Record of Lodos War started out as a um as a D as a D and D replay. It got made. It got made into. A it got made into a couple a couple anime series, and um, the, and a few years ago got a game adaptation with um, Deedlit in Wonder Labyrinth. Um, but when, but to you to use a to use another um, another example when it comes to that whole when it comes to the video game end of things, look at say Skies of Arcadia, which incidentally celebrated its um, 21st anniversary today. Happy birthday. Um. Where you de you definitely have you definitely have a lot of a lot of a lot of airship design, but also a, also a significant amount of fantastical elements. There's the, there's the whole thing that, um, as much as it uses the term Final Fantasy in Final Fantasy, even from day one, you could you couldn't put it in a strict fantasy category the way you. Oh well, no, I mean I mean the best Final Fantasy setting is Midgard, and that is so not fantasy, like it. You know, it, we it, are it is, so far but not away. In, but not, like, in the, not in the sense that... Not in the, yeah, Tolkien-esque stuff. Yeah. I, call, I call it the Tolkien melting pot. Or, um... Yes! <laughs> that's, that's a good way of putting it, yeah. That whole, that whole... It's, it's, try, it's trying to be like Tolkien, but at the same time, it isn't. Um, kind of... No, I, I hear that. Um, but that's like, I mean... It, there's obviously elements of fantasy whenever you're talking about magic or things like that, but... Oh, yeah. The the genre is so saturated at this point, like so saturated, yeah. and it doesn't help that, to my mind, you know, there aren't that many games that actually, you know, are are fairly adequate at bringing across medieval life, you know, in terms of uh, the difficulties with communication and travel, and you know, I mean, like <laughs> feudalism, I guess. The closest um, one I can think of that tried was chivalry and sorcery, which was. Much like yeah. Rollmaster, a case of a D and D hack that got out of hand. Um, <laughs> yeah, there was that brief period and the where, where like everything was trying to be like a D and D clone and just trying out little iterations on the same formula. Well, it was it was the it was the early it was the early days in the seventies when nobody really knew what they um what they what they were do, what they were doing. This Appropriately, a Wild West. Yeah. yeah. Um. But the but. It's boring. Like, yeah, like I, it's think, not... I think at this point, it's boring. Trying, I've, I have all. My mantra has always been, um, believability is better than realism. Yes, uh, internal consistency is the term that I bang on about a lot. But I think it's the same thing, right? Where it's like, yeah. it doesn't matter if you have chaos as long as everything's predictable. 
it's fine. And that's so important in a game because players have to make decisions and they can't make a decision if they don't know what's going to ha- Like, if they can't predict what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, do, you re- do you remember the tagline for the original Superman movie? No, I do not. You will believe that a man can fly. I've, I've, the, the key thing is, is that no matter how, ri- how, ri- how ridiculous, how ridiculous things get, is if, if, if you, pre- if you present it in a way that I can go along with it, then, the, then half the job is already done. That's it, and and just as long as you're consistent, this is why I've got like mm-hmm. such mad respect for certain like series where they just sort of sit down and look at you and go, "Here is the way this world works. You now need to go along with us on this." Like you know, and if if you can't accept this opening thesis statement, then you're not going to get on with the rest of the material. Like yeah, looking at you, Sanderson. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah 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 i was gonna say like god i need to read some more of sanderson stuff but i must confess like it all just sort of um blend into one big m- i don't want to say mess because it's not messy at all but like i said it's just like one big piece of like quasi industrial magic thing um, that's very well written. i have i i have been i've been listening to the graphic audio version which is kind of which is kind of like an audio drama of yeah. um, the stormlight archive um I fin I I finished I um I'm waiting I'm waiting for book four to f- to have finished all of its parts I'm currently um I I had most recently finished book three, um, and even even in that kind even in that kind of setting while it is all it is in all it is fantasy um it has a lo- it has a lot more in common with the with the Middle East rather th- rather than the ver- rather than the kind of um, invariably which, western european style i, can, yeah, I can't no. even i can't even say i can't even say western european because a lot of a lot a lot of fantasy in that tolkien melting pot leans far more um british isles than, yes. a, than anything else which i think is the reason why um why something like the witcher caught on so well in eastern europe yes because, yeah a bit of polish literature i do like the witcher the books are really good yeah um I like the I like the Witcher. I don't like the author. Yeah, no, Sapkowski is a complete bell end. Like, like, no, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, it, him renaging on contracts and so on. But what are you gonna do? I mean, to be honest, like, you know, maybe, maybe. God, when did Cyberpunk come out? I'm trying to think because, like, you know, a while ago the opinion would have been a lot, le- lot less controversial, saying, "Man, yeah, screw that guy." But now CD Projekt Red's reputation's in the fucking dust. It's all a mess now. So, um, yeah. I think, I think that, I think that they're on their way to to recovery. It's just that they've had, just that they've had some bad luck. What with that whole, um. That whole having some having some of their stuff put up for a ransom. I remember that. I remember that. Yeah, because um, oh god, no, the No Man's Sky team had that happen to them as well. Yeah, Hello yeah. Games. That's, that's their lot. Yeah, and Who knows, maybe they maybe they can perform a, a, an uptick like uh, no, like Hello Games did. I think I think they can. I think they can, and I think they're on. I think they're on the way to doing that. It's just that a lot of people, um, a lot of people got it in their heads that CD Projekt Red is a AAA studio when they're not. Um, no, they're not. They're 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 that mysterious bit of like double A, which is where like you know the sort of developers of the Metro games and like you find this you know sort of primarily I I, I mean I think anyway in the sort of like periphery of the ultra wealthy countries you know mm-hmm. because it but it's nice because it it harkens back to that magic PS2 era where like anyone could develop a a good looking game for the PS2 so you had just so many titles and like that's why you get so many good titles from that era just cuz the sheer volume of the fuckers the, the funny thing about that era is that you is that you had a very strong middle market that could also be used as a fee, as a feeding system um since with a, you had you had of course the heavy hitters, but th- but those were supported by a by a middle market um of alter- of alternatives, and if if one of those middle market en- entries ended up getting enough traction, it could be bu- it could be bumped up into so- into something with a bigger budget. Um, yeah, you know, in the same in the same way that you've got the um you got you got say the the minor leagues or the or the de- or a developmental system in a lot of um in a lot of sports. Um, yeah. I'd br- like bring, bringing up some of the talent and all that. No, I hear you. Um, I suppose I suppose the the best example I can come up with off, off the top of my head is stuff is is stu- is stuff like the minor leagues and major leagues in in um, baseball, but also um, 
F2 versus um, F1. I was, about, I, was, I was literally about to say, yeah, the formula series, because um, it's it, yeah, it's the same thing where like you can climb your way up and it's a way of incubating good competition. But yeah, yeah Ma- imagine if we had that in tabletop. What a fucking laugh that would be if it wasn't just the, <laughs> that one game and everyone else is consigned to make zines and suck on um, skirting boards for moisture, for sustenance. <laughs> but, um, and the the other reason that I the other reason that I could that when I when trying to assess the genre of something like defenders I could I couldn't go with World War One is because um, you have you have automatic weapons and in World War One automatic weapons were a thing but not but really 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 bleeding edge. And that's and that's pretty much what they're tre- that's pretty much what they're treated as in Dong, to be fair, because like um they can be picked up in Karen, but to be honest, it was a, it was a mechanical niche that existed because um uh there was a niche for a ranged tank and also to give strength a way of interacting at least somewhat a range, and so the machine gun pretty much got drafted for that. It's been interesting with the world building because I've been coming it's been coming with all sorts of these like tiny little reasons why you know. Uh, things have developed in the way that they have, and like you know, have, have made, there's well, probably one of the only differences uh, between our world and Donk is that there's a magic metal basically that can a nullify magic, but has all sorts of wondrous properties that are very conveniently all-purpose cavity plot insulation. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. whenever I need something explained, I can just throw this this metal at the problem. Yeah. Now, um, when it comes speaking of weapons, when it comes to when it comes to that table, especially when it comes to um. When it comes to melee weapons, you divide them between um, finesse weapons and and strength weapons. Um, That's right. Yeah. What to you was is the divi- is the dividing lines between the between those two categories? Putting aside the whole one hand or two handed. Oh, oh, oh it's a, so it's it's literally cosmetic to my mind, you know, because um, you could argue that the sword, just a sword, is either a finesse weapon or a strength weapon. Mm-hmm. It really is only the gameplay ramifications, because um, in in the game, basically, the higher strength you've got, the more armor you've got. The and strength weapons do slightly more damage. Meanwhile, the more agility you've got, the more movement you've got, and everyone needs movement, but deal slightly less damage. Um, so realistically, it's just you know what fantasy do people want? It's mm-hmm. you know do do you want more agility in which case pick a finesse weapon but you know we've had people who are whose finesse weapons have been rapiers and other people's have been katanas and other people's have been like significantly more anime bullshit right like you know um god i'm trying to remember the butler from helsing you know using like the piano wire gloves uh, or whatever um um, um well Walter. Walter. That's that's the one. That's the one. I love, I love that show. Um uh, meanwhile you've got um you know strength which is just I mean things can be a strength weapon because like you know we were discussing this and like a long sword is a perfectly fine strength weapon you know mm-hmm. as is a mace but you know you need to use these things with a degree of finesse but it was purely cosmetic like the 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 order in which things have been done in the game for I want to say 99% of it has been mechanics first, and then using, you know, and then dressing it up to, you know, fit a fantasy as much as possible. Mm-hmm. But it's absolutely been that way around. You know, it's like you want to distinguish between quick fighters and strong fighters, but I, I don't really care where people draw the line on, say, like, I'm trying to think of another weapon that could realistically fill the gap between the two of them. Like, say, like a flambeige or something, which is like a, you know, a curved greatsword. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. A... I'd I'd say a um stock, which yes is, yeah that's a good example is, yeah is technically is technically a two handed weapon but an stock is you is more of a is more of a thrusting than a than a uh, chopping weapon. Oh. And and to, to my mind, I find it kind of arbitrary because um you also run the risk, for example, like, you know, like uh, I'm oh, fuck, I'm gonna shit on D and D, you know, like it's it's got the market share. Hey, hey, hey. Um, we hold these truths <laughs> to be self evident. That all yeah, that are we created do. equal. Okay, maybe not their works. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, but no, that's all right. No. But I just mean things like, so for example, if you have, say, like, you know, uh, I, I don't remember the stats from DD, but say, like, a longsword deals mm-hmm. a D8 and a warhammer deals a D10 or whatever, like, you know, at that point, you've just created an objectively better choice. For, for a power gamer, the one who wants to get damage, they're now going to be conflicted between these weapons, even if they would prefer to be actually using the sword for aesthetic reasons. But, like, frankly, the aesthetic is no concern of the of the game master whatsoever like you know or sorry the game designer mm-hmm. 
I should say, you know, like aesthetic just exists to let players get more into the fantasy. So just if any aesthetic concessions can be made, they absolutely should. So yeah, yeah that that's and yeah. The th one of the things that I try and hammer I try and hammer home with my players is that um there is that not ev not every sword has to be a um has to be a long sword. Exactly. Exactly. Um, you got dirks, you've got all kinds. Yeah, I um one of my one of my favorite shape designs of when it comes to when it comes to ancient swords is the Kopesh. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. great choice, yeah. And anti armor pick. Very mm -hmm. cool. Um I just I just love I just love that um, that whole almost scythe like design of of the thing. Um I think the yeah. I think the um something like a falx can be can can certainly be interesting. It it's it is literally what would happen if you took a scythe and stra and straightened it out and gave and gave it a two handed handle. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> um unlike 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 some unlike some people in fantasy gaming, i.e. um grogs. I yeah. actively encourage um, anime bullshit, as you put it. <laughs> yeah, right. The, right. Here's the thing, right? Like, anime is cool. Like, as as much as don't get me wrong. Like, I I, I hate ninety percent of anime in the sense that you know, like, you hate ninety percent of everything because you don't get on with it, right, or whatever. Sturgeon, hates the strong Sturgeon's word. law. Any ninety percent of everything yeah. is crap. Yeah, you know, sorry, hate's a strong word, but you get what I mean. Mm -hmm. But, like, the 10% of anime is just absolutely golden, and it's like, yeah, some people want to be, like, wind samurais and so on, and, like, to an extent, I'm, like, I don't know if this is... Well, I, I dream of the idea that Donk is some kind of pioneer here, but, like, is, I mean, is it just me, or is the hobby a little bit behind on this stuff? Because I did a lot of research when I started up, you know, the game and trying to find, like, other games which don't, like, you know, it's easy to ape the anime aesthetic. It's easy to, like, you know, get a manga author to draw all over your game. Mm -hmm. But, like, are there any that really encourage the kind of, like, you know the the actual anime standoffs, the sort of like the very clean aesthetic, um, the idea that the action should be very sudden, the idea that you know, you know, everyone's everyone's appear. There's a reason why you know a lot of people's profile pictures are anime is because anime looks good. Like you know, it doesn't matter like you know what you actually look like or have you. It's a it's a clean aesthetic that you can build it on and like. You know, and I, I see no reason to take advantage of that. And I mean, I, I've only got one point of reference as far as a turn of the century anime goes, which is Full Metal Alchemist. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good, it's a good reference point to have. But like, I think the really important part there is the fact that the genre um, and the time period are just, are almost irrelevant in the face of like, you know, just what you're trying to invoke, mm -hmm. and that's a sense of urgency in the combat and um, things like that. I. Uh... If you ever if you ever get the ch if it's an older one but if you ever get the chance I get the feeling you'd get a kick out of Last Exile. Okay, I'll um, make a note of that. Make a note of that. You will you will have to you will have to deal with um with with some bits of, with some bits of mixing C mixing CG and anime in the early 2000s which is um and of its <laughs> oh, time. Oh yeah, 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 don't worry, don't worry the like yeah. It's an it's uh, it's an of its time kind of thing. Mhm. Mm um, mhm. Mm that's all right. I'm actually. I mean, I'm going to be rewatching Card Captors. Oh, so actually, that 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 reminds me. Sorry, just just on the weapon conversation. There's a game that came out recently called um, Boyfriend Dungeon. Um, oh yeah. It's, it's yeah. A, yeah, where it's like you know you're know, sort of playing with it with a good friend and. Um, uh, at one point, there's a character who is a scimitar. I thought, and then at some point later on, I say, "Oh, are you a scimitar?" He says, "I'm actually a talwar, but you know, I guess you only know scimitars." And I felt like such a tit. <laughs> that just reminded me of that. Like, I love the fact they actually called me out on my shit. That was so funny. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm actually going to be rewatching like Card Captor. Sorry, not rewatching, watching Card Captor Sakura. Um, with that person, and like you know, I'm 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 looking forward to seeing some classic '90s and 2000s anime jank. Like. Yeah. But to an to answer your question now, keep now keep in mind I'm only I'm only going from my own perspective and experiences, um, both both as a heavy game player and as a wannabe historian. But, um, in the early um, while while it's not as much of an issue as it nowadays as it was um twenty years ago, there is still a degree of especially especially in especially in um fantasy gaming. Of ghettoizing um, manga influences, there. Okay, how, how, how do you mean? What I mean, but what I mean by that is that is there's been this there's been this idea of of keeping of keeping that kind of thing, 
um, in the in this of keeping any keeping anything with a, with anime influences in a separate discrete category, much in the same way that um, a lot of a lot of people who are fans of animation get really annoyed when you refer to um, the animation genre. It's not a genre; it's a medium. Um, yeah. The same thing. Same thing ends up getting applied to anime because the first wave of quote unquote anime games were one step removed from universal games because they were because they were they were they were kind of taking that idea of trying to trying to trying to accompany trying to accompany um and the entire the entirety of the medium so so everything everything from the more actiony end of things to this to the slice of life end of th end of things all in all in one system um as t as time went on you started to see less and less of those and more of games trying to emulate um, a specific genre as a whole. Um, yeah, so, lo 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 lots of things like mech games and like you know high school slice of life stuff. But like, I'd say I'd say one of the yeah. I'd say one of the early pioneers in pushing for this whole focusing on a, on a specific genre um, is our Telsorian games. What was was stuff like Mechton and um, Teenagers from Outer Space? Yeah. Um, the the other the other major pioneer of co of course was. Um, Guardians of Order now Disca now Discami Gaming, um, what with um, Big Eyes Small Mouth, and and so and some of the um, some of the follow ups that were made that were specifically designed around a a given a given series like say um, Slayers D twenty. Um, yeah. Uh, but even even with even with all of that, there is there is still this there is still this attit there is still this um attitude. That a lot, a lot of people in tabletop gaming have of, um, if you, of if you're doing fantasy, you have to do it in that Tolkien melting pot I mentioned before, and if and um if you're do if you're bringing in anime influences, you, um, it's a that's a on the fringe kind of concept, which you would, I guess it is. Would I, think, I would think you would accuse think those would, people of having fun. <laughs> you would think you would think that after after all this time that would that wouldn't as much be the case, especially given the, especially given how much bank um manga is manga is doing where where um co where no matter how no matter how many number ones they keep putting out co um comic books aren't competing <laughs> and yeah, I, I know it... i know this because i get the numbers i get the numbers for it every month and it is largely dominated by um in the gra in the graphic novel end of things it's largely dominated by manga it's been it's been that way it's been that way for set for several months at the very least and um the, because because of that you would you would think that there would that there would be a great that there would be a greater push towards um towards integrating some of that into some of into some of the more popular fantasy games but then I, but then i remember but apparently um some people are 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 too skittish about that and try and Especially, especially given what happened with the infamous Book of Nine Swords incident in the early two thousands. Uh, I'm afraid I don't know that incident. I was very young at the time. Um, Tome of Battle Book of Nine Swords was a ex was an expansion book for D and D third edition, and the key the key with it was to try and give martial characters something to do besides basic attack all day every day. Mm hmm. And um. Some, the, you it was a very divisive book. On one hand, you had you had people who appreciated that it actually di that it actually um, gave 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 uh, martial characters something to do. On the other hand, you had a lot you had a lot of characters feeling like it was feeling like it was um, on one hand turning D and D into, into anime because they they did admit very a handful of anime and video games served as inspiration for the game. Um, and on the on the other hand, um, some are some arguing that it um, stepped it stepped into the realm it stepped on the toes of casters and made and made fighters casters. Um, I don't agree with that personally, but that was an argument that was made. Oh, uh, I mean, fair enough, it was made, but I'm not gonna lie. Like like D and D combat is awful if you don't have any kind of like magic or whatever, because it really is just run up to it and hit it with a stick. Like uh, from. For me personally, when when that argument was made, I I do remember blowing up at somebody because third edition, 
the does at the very least I, at the very least I'm suspecting Monty Cook on this had a massive boner for giving more spells to and more options to casters. Yeah. Like years ago I didn't I did an experiment of of the pages to spells versus total pages um ratio. D&D and Pathfinder are the two biggest offenders. D&D 3rd edition I should say. Yeah. And well I mean it, it, it to an extent as a designer it's fun coming up with spells like you know it's cool codifying these like hey these awesome ideas but like I don't know. It just if you if the game is boring, the game is boring, and like to me, I think there just needs to be a bit more. I'm gonna say challenge. I'm not gonna say that means the game needs to necessarily be harder, but like God, just something more than just point and click, really. You know. Um. For me, uh, for me, the uh, the attitude the attitude I've al the attitude I've always had is um, I um, I obviously. Growing up in the '90s, obviously I was I was inundated with those with those early spins of to, of Togusatsu, um, Power Rangers especially, and yeah, I, and I would I love and, Power I, Rangers. and I also I also grew up with a with a fair with a fair few um, action cartoons. Um, some of them some of them have been fondly remembered. Some of some of them have been forgotten. No nobody yeah. but me seems to seems to remember that Zoro had a cartoon in the '90s. I watched Zorro. <laughs> I remember that. I had, I had um, a video tape of it. <laughs> but there, there was that. There, um, you had um stuff like Calamity Jane, which is which has has never been yes! released on DVD. Um, yes. Oh my god! Apparently, we watched the same programs. Um, Me as a wee lad growing up in Scotland. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, Phantom Twenty Forty, which um I only knew I only knew as that. I never I didn't know I didn't know until years later the kind of legacy that the Phantom character has. Um. Or the fact that that was the first time I'd see um, P Peter Chung and his, and his particular brand of insanity because I didn't see I didn't grow up watching Aeon Flux, um, and that and I would I remember getting old tapes of, and seeing and 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 seeing stuff like um, stuff like stuff like Errol Errol Flynn stuff and oh and a lot of these a lot of these swashbuckly stuff that I would that I would see in that I would see in movies. And of of course, growing up with a lot of with a lot of uh, martial arts films and a lot of samurai films, I'm jealous. Where where you ha you have that you have that kind of thing where you have where you have almost a dance of back of back and forth between between strikes and pa and parries and what and whatnot. And you're asking me to take all of that and distill that into one d20 roll. And you can't. You you just can't. Like at a minimum, you need to have some kind of system of targeting places or something reactive. Mm -hmm. But um, it but the GM cannot, by definition, you know, give you feedback and any decision that can be that is made under a time frame of one second. So you can't represent super fast combat like that unless you're willing to slow down the game literally. There's, like there's al there's also the fact that um, while I did while I did grow up with wrestling, it was it wasn't necessarily um the WWF at the time. Um, mm. In fact, I I ended I ended up spending more time watch watching sec watching secondhand tapes of um of 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 say um of say e, of say ECW during their during their early days, and th and then later on when I learned when I learned about tape trading, seeing stuff that was going on in Mexico or going on in Japan, mm. and the Mexico thing is a, is especially important with this because of how lucha libre is like is like a dance between two people, um. And I'm supposed, I'm supposed to, and again, I'm supposed to con condense all of that into a into a single d20 roll. And the the argument that I would often hear is that you need to be more descriptive with how you with with your action. But when when the when it amounts to the same die roll, whether I described it with one sentence or one paragraph, what's the point? Yeah, there isn't. It's it, a game is made of its systems and its mechanics. Mm -hmm. Narrative is fluff. It's very nice fluff, but all it does is provide context for interesting, meaningful decisions. Sorry, I will say, I, I uh, over the course of the past year, I, uh, I ended up writing out the GM guide for the game, and um, uh, and to do that, I pretty much just wrote down all my thoughts on game design. And it must be said that was a very therapeutic exercise, and I wholeheartedly recommend everyone does it. It came out to fifty-seven thousand words, which obviously is being trimmed down. But like, I don't know. I just 
it feels like the fundamentals of game design are very easily forgotten, especially in the tabletop sphere when the sky is the limit, but that makes it even more important to come up with good mechanics. Yeah, and um I think I think that there's a lot that there's a lot of a lot of potential variety when it com when it comes to when it comes to mechanics. I think I think if there's anything that ho that holds that holds des that holds certain designers back, it's the it's the idea that there is some that there is some set of commandments with design that they ha that they have to follow because that's the way things have always been done. Um, no, and then that's just untrue. Like... That's, that's the reason that when whenever I've had you on or had other people on, I fo I focus so much on the um, whys. The the why question when it comes to when it comes to mechanics or comes to certain decisions, because of, because of the fact that um, art is a response to other arts, and when you when sure. you have that when you have that kind of th when you have the answer to that why, it's a lot easier to determine the um, the lo the logic behind a certain decision. It's yeah, it's about intentionality, which is really hard to separate because uh, it, it's it's weird because obviously when it comes to like, you know someone doing an action, to someone else you have to judge them by that action, you know. But when it comes to a creative effort or like say a sporting effort or something, you do often have to judge by intentionality because you can improve upon intentionality. Mm -hmm. Whereas you know actions are, if if so, if someone has like put thought in, I, I'd much rather play someone who has put uh, play a game where someone has put thought. And create a bad mechanic rather than someone who has fluked their way into a good mechanic, right? Like, because mm -hmm. you can improve the first one, you can improve the second one. Yeah. And because um, because there are design best practices, and I really do feel that anti-intellectualism is a bit pervasive in some of the tabletop discourse, but that just comes from a general fear of vocabulary and describing things as opposed to just intuiting stuff and leaving it all to the GM, because fundamentally it is a game at the end of the day and there will be best practices, but at the same time, a part of best practices is once you know them, you can break them. Like I find I find that the whole leave I find the whole leave it to the GM to be a little bit too, a little bit too much of a um of a of a bandage. Um, yeah, it's 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 reductive. Put, it's lazy you're, design. You're putting you're putting ex you're putting extra work on the guy who's already going to be working himself half to death as it is. Exactly, and and it's lazy because you know your job as a designer is balancing two things, which is depth and complexity. Because every every time you introduce a rule, you add complexity, and there's oh, there's a finite limit to the amount of complexity players and a GM and whatever can understand, right? But every time you add to complexity, you're also able to codify depth and like, you know, the idea is you as a designer actually know what you're on about. So if you're designing a combat system, the idea being that you can provide one for a GM because you're probably going to think of a better one than a GM if they're on the fly and you've had years of development time. Mm -hmm. But the idea, but you can cover all situations. That's absolutely true. You don't want to cover all situations. Open freedom is you know, the reason why we're here. Like, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, if there wasn't freedom, then we'd all just play video games, because video games are largely superior. Um, you know, everything apart from the you get to make whatever choices you want aspect, which is the most important part of a game, so it's fine. Yeah. Um, but, you know, to then, to then just turn around and say, for your core gameplay loop... We'll leave that to the G leave that to the GM. Well, at that point, all you've said is we don't know what the best gameplay mechanic is, so we're not going to bother encoding it. Um, so best of luck, GM. Don't get me wrong; you shouldn't encode everything. I mean, one of my pet peeves with games like Shadowrun is the fact that they have got at the back of the book that fucking awful range table, which you're supposed to consult every time you shoot a gun um, for a you know, net negative to shooting a particular range, and it is awful and it is too fiddly, and they try to explain too much but at the same time just t just having your core resolution mechanic be ah uh, you know like chuck a dice and then let the gm decide on everything else i i think that's unfair on a gm you know yeah um although what um chuck a die rather. when it comes it's funny you mentioned shadowrun because i remember mentioning that er um earlier on since that since I hate to keep picking on Shadowrun, but it does. It is emblematic of a couple oh, of issues. It's it it the, the weird thing is is that like 
in the middle of it. It's it's one of those weird cases where it's not it's it's not fucking bland. I'll give it that credit. No. And there is fundamentally a good game in Shadowrun somewhere. It just has possibly the most flab of any game I've played that's not like Metal Gear Solid Four. <laughs> right? I'd say, like... I'd say <laughs> as divisive as it is, I'd say Shadowrun Sixth Edition doesn't have this problem as much. Yeah. Um. I've not but, played Six. I heard it was shit. <laughs> um, I re I reviewed I reviewed Sixth Edition um about about a year or so ago, and I I said it's good, but I want to but when a when an equivalent to the Runner's Toolkit comes out, I want to come back and revisit it. Yeah. Um. The. Sure. Um. Sixth Edition feels feels like it felt like it was um it wanted to lean a little bit more into. Into into providing more action to its to its action, almost like it almost like it wanted to take a few notes from take take a few notes from a John Woo movie, or um, mm. po or possibly take some nods to uh, nods to game games that have more of a stunt system like Feng Shui. It's essentially just adding more fidelity, but it, it, it's a doomed. Uh, what is it? You're doing for failure, just because you know, you, you, in a turn-based system, you cannot have the same degree of slow mo shooting in multiple directions, turning around, smooth action. Like you know, you you what, can't represent it with that kind of fidelity. What I mean, what I mean by that is they um they ended up re they ended up reworking how Edge works. Uh, yeah, I I remember which, which which I do think is a bad decision in my opinion, but that's because I think that Edge is just probably one of the best mechanics I think you could ever have in tabletop honestly um, like the, the the old way it worked anyway um it ends it ends up be, it ends up being a bit being a bit of a moment a momentum system where instead of um, yeah. you're you're constantly gaining and lo and losing edge dur during an during an encounter um but the the big reason that I'd be that I'd be a bit more willing to recommend 6th edition to people who are a bit, are a bit um averse has to do with the fact that it does not have as many skills because that's the thing that oh, I keep picking Christ, on Shadowrun yes. for, for the most I, is the ungodly amount of amount of um amount of skills. I remember like the fact that there's like what like six different pilot skills or something like that. I mean, I get the need to separate and, you know helicopters from motorbikes, but like fucking hell, I remember that. Don't get don't get me start don't get me started on um on knowledge skills in games. <laughs> But you don't like knowledge skills. Um, when they're when they're used when they're used properly, I don't, oh, obvi I, ob obviously, obviously, yeah, issue, but obviously, you know, but yeah, knowledge yeah, but skills can very easily lead to bloat. Yeah, especially when especially when you have when you have not when you have when you have to have a separate knowledge skill for it for indi for individual um individual subjects or topics, that is. And um, that and that keep in mind that acquiring and upgrading those skills is in the same pool as your more important sk skills that actually help that, you that, survive that, that's fights. where it falls apart. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Like they, I, I mean, I personally like them because they're an easy way of allowing characters to like you know customize their knowledge without having to write down a list of every interest and every academic skill known to known to man but like I'm, I'm surprised honestly i'm surprised to hear that i thought that'd be up your alley really um i the it's with a, with a lot of things this this all goes down to um to the to the execution of things oh and, yeah um, yeah shadow i'd say shadowrun and pathfinder are two examples of what of how not to use them because the I'd say the I'd say the other, it the other issue the other issue, when it comes to when it comes to knowledge skills, at when they're when they're, they're when they're their own skill, is is the fact that, you're only going to be using that check in a very specific cir set of circumstances, as opposed yeah. to as a, where comparatively you're going to be using there are going to be less situations where you would have to roll. A knowledge skill check versus, say, an acrobatics skill check or or an. Well, I agree. I mean, check. I mean, I ideally you want your list of air quotes base skills to be as tight as possible. Mm -hmm. And because of because of and that's why the, that's why those two entries are in my in my view um a couple a couple ways to do to do it wrong, um, 
there's there's oh there's also the fa there's also the fact that um when it comes when it comes to when it comes to we when it comes to say um skills for individual weapons do you really do you really need to have do you really need to have a have a separate um level of adv separate level of advancement for for your pistols and that and then and then have a separate skill for knowing how pistols work <laughs> Oh well, no, and like, and, and well, no, but this is what we, you know, just alluded to mm -hmm. when I'm saying that every time you have that degree of granularity, you add to complexity, which is unnecessary because you want to keep your game as it's it's an amazing balance you have to strike because complexity is a bad word and you don't want complexity, but it is fundamentally impossible to have a game that you know your your upper limit of depth is your complexity yeah. so you know that's where you need to be very careful to as you say combine those things so, yeah i think um i think complex i think complexity has been has been treated as has been treated as a bit of um as george carlin would say spooky language <laughs> uh, yes yeah large largely because of the main reason that i say that is and i've seen i don't mean to i don't mean to pick on certain des certain designers or cert or 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 the like, but it it but um it is what it is. Um, there's been an there's been an attitude over over several years that you that you should avoid complexity and embrace simplicity. Which um no, it's yeah the the language no. is simply inadequate there. The the ish, the complex complexity is not it is not an issue. The issue, the issue is the is the fact that on both that it's all in the execution. If you if you're not if you're not executing it to to what to what your what um what it's designed to be doing, that's when you have a problem. That's that's the reason why I bring up say the um not the knowledge skills in 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 um something like. In some in something like Shadowrun or Pathfinder, especially since, um, for all intents and purposes, Shadowrun is not going to be run is not going to be run in a very investigative style all that often. No, it's go it's going to be. There, that's not to say there isn't going to be investigation, but it isn't going to be it's run in the same level of, in, of investigation as yeah. say Gumshoe, which is purposely no, designed not. for that kind of thing. So so ev so because because of that having having that level of having those amount of um amount of knowledge or information skills is is um is is largely is largely pointless unless you unless you do a setup where you where you um divide the pool the pool i.e. Yeah. at character creation you have your skill you have you have a separate um, set of points for physical skills and a separate set of points for knowledge skills. Then, at the very least, you you can dip into that without having to worry that it's going to screw over the skills you actually need to survive. Yeah. Um. But getting getting back getting back on the proverbial rails for a moment. There's there is sure, one, sure. um one other one other bad habit. Among um among fantasy gaming that I do, that I, I do I do I do want to I do want to touch on especially since we brought especially since we brought it up a couple of times is magic. Yes, magic systems. Because um, it is it is very easy and very tempting to have to have casters um get a get a whole ho get a whole host of options. But all, but also, ha all, and also have it that casters be a little bit too useful. I mean, I you've probably you've probably heard you've probably heard about Codzilla at least once. Uh, no, actually, you may have to enlighten me on that one. Um, Codzilla, Cod and Codzilla is is a is a um is an acronym for cleric or druid. Right. Okay. And. It's called it's called that because in um in third edition D and D especially, um, a properly optimized cleric or dru or druid or God help you a, a multi class cleric and druid was D and D on easy mode. Right. Okay. And I'm I get the I get the feeling that when it comes to your approach with magic, 
you um you wanted to make sh you you probably wanted to make sure that that um that magic doesn't doesn't um become over useful compared to everything else. No, bad balance is key in all game design. I I really don't get on with people who say that oh but you know the game doesn't have to be balanced it's like yes it does like if you don't have remember, a balanced game then it I remember, validates choices i remember john wick saying that and i was like yeah that's that's a that is a that is a load of crap it's 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 absolute shit uh, i i would go so far as to say that someone who makes that statement doesn't fundamentally get why games are appealing to players but anyway mm -hmm. um sorry uh, so, sorry i didn't know if you said something there but no, like um okay cool but like um yeah it's it, it's too tempting to make it easy and and in the case of say for example you know cleric uh, cleric druid or bust i would make the argument that you know there's not enough play testing has occurred mm -hmm. there because like you know any, any kind of like issue like that should become apparent fairly quickly when you're doing play testing but it's because it's 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 tempting because i get it it's like you, you know you want say for example you are doing D D, and one of your main appeals is fantasy like as in literally the fantasy of being a druid a cleric uh, a warrior a, a rogue it's literally encoded in the classes so you're like okay well how do we bring across the idea of being a druid so you have a meeting you write down it literally everything you can think of about druids um then you turn all of them into a spell and then you turn to that same team and go all right write down everything we can think of about being a warrior the fuck do you do then <laughs> like you know that that's so unhelpful like you know like oh i guess you attack more like brilliant um yeah, it's it's very tempting to do that, but that's where you just have to be careful. And like, I also feel that um, approaching magic from the wrong direction can also not help because, um, so you know, for example, in Donk, it's eight schools of magic, and um, there's five there's five schools each. Um, the reason they've been grouped, grouped into themes is because the game already has a free you know power system. It's got the contract system; you can make whatever superpower you want, right? Um, but what you end up doing is. You make a long, you know, as a game designer, you make a long list, and that list is what are the most common powers I can think of someone doing. Now, you're probably not going to have like what I did once when when a player came to me with an ability which is turn anything into its equivalent weight in buckets. That's probably still my favorite contract that was ever suggested. Mm -hmm. But you get some commonalities. You get flying. You get um, you know, dealing extra damage. Fire a lightning bolt. Create some fire. Um, and then once you pair those up with niches that already exist in your combat systems, so if they, for example, you just need like you need straight up damage that you know something can't dodge. You turn that into a lightning bolt, and then you code that into magic. You do not do it the other way around. You do not say like, "Ooh, I want to have." this spell, this spell, and this spell, in a game that already has superpowers. Like, you know, you've got to approach it from the other direction. But it, you're in a bind when you, when you, the moment you introduce classes, you're kind of doomed, because the moment you introduce classes, you're looking for ways to represent that class, and that's always going to create imbalance, because fundamentally, the idea of a druid is just better than a warrior. There's more to do. There's just more choice. There's more to play with. Mm -hmm. And ideal, ideal, even, even, and it's, I'd say this is even more so when you're doing a, when you're doing a game that um, that is pro that is properly cla that is properly classless because yeah we've we've seen we've seen I think you and I have seen our fair share of games that purport to be classless but once you actually sit down with them they're not guess... yeah no it's it, it gives some op options and like you know that that's to be commended obviously but no like. It's largely otherwise just, you know, you can go down these routes or you are you can just, you know, not make a unfun build, like a, just a non-meta build. And I, I don't mean I don't mean to once again pick on Shadowrun, but it's another example of this. Kind uh, of thing, so. Go for it. Oh, yeah, well, a, a rigor, a street Sam. This game is allegedly supposed to be classless but everyone knows these terminologies yeah and fundamentally if you it, it, it may be less for a street sam because that's the equivalent of like a standard warrior but if you're wanting to make a rigor there is a right way to make a rigor right <laughs> like you know so, rig like rigors ma rigors mages shamans the face man the face man the these these aside from the fact that these archetypes are front and center early on in the in the core book as as the seven yes. pregens there is there is the fact that several of several of these are 
what are well are um well are well established terms with terms within the within the universe. Um, yes, I know there is the temptation by, by some to put um to put some Cyberpunk twenty twenty and Cyberpunk Red in the in this category, but their set um that game's setup is far is far more in line with um with archetypes. Since you, since whatever your since whatever your um, build is, whether you're media, whether you're a solo, whether you're a rocker boy, there are certain skills that you're gonna get access just by being that archetype. Yeah. So it doesn't. So for this kind of thing, it doesn't really count. But it, but it it is, and I I cannot I can understand I can understand why there's the temptation to put those kind of archetype setups because. When you go full freeform, there's the there's the risk of scaring people off. Oh, you do have to provide some kind of guidance, and like there will be most common archetypes. And this is where once again, like the idea of doing playtesting is important. But a, you keep it optional, which is fair. Um, and b, you just sort of present like I don't know. I, I'd almost liken it to um, good achievements in games, where like a, a good achievement in like say a video game isn't the one where it's like collect a hundred badger pelts. It's the ones that are trying to encourage you into an interesting way of playing. Like, uh, Crusader Kings is really good at this, where, like, one of their achievements will be something like, as a Viking, conquer this kingdom. Mm -hmm. And they're not telling you, oh, this is the correct way to play. They're saying, if you do this combination of things, something interesting will happen. You know, and, and you also do, you can do that in a classes game, where you can provide guidance, be able to say, like, hey, if you take this quality, this quality, and magic, um, that all mixes together in the way that you'd expect. And here's an interesting combination. Why don't you try it? So... Yeah. And when it comes to when it, when, it, when it comes to that kind of thing, now you um since you meant since you mentioned the whole thing of of everybody having like like one one um one unique power to themselves. Everyone uh, yep, everyone gets a superpower. They have to. <laughs> um, have you have are there have you put in have you put in a sort of baseline in ter in terms of in terms of what might be what might what kind of what level of superpower might be pushing the DM's buttons? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's a fair way of putting it. There is guidance as to how to like balance the contracts. Um, it comes back to the idea again of like you know. Uh, so take for example, your contract is fire a laser beam, right? Mm -hmm. Fine. Like, you know, fundamentally, that's just a cosmetic deal damage. And in the game, you can buy a contract point that's worth 15 experience points. And that one point adds 3d10 of damage to a contract, mm -hmm. right? And that's and that's just that is a balanced conversion because fundamentally, one contract point has got to be exchangeable with every other commodity. Of it's got to be worth X meters of movement. It's got to be worth Y damage. It's got to be worth Z successes required to avoid, you know, a mind control effect. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where playtesting is so important because uh, a player might turn around and say, okay, I want a contract which summons a wolf. Okay, mm -hmm. fair enough. Pretty straightforward one. What exact form that should take is not immediately obvious, especially to a GM who does not know the system well. This GM doesn't really know what one HP does. Mm -hmm. They don't really know what damage does. They don't really know how many meters of movement it is. However, you know, me as the game designer, with plenty of experience in the game, we've tried out many different kinds. We've gone, okay, this way to do summons tends to be the best one. So we're going to put in some guidance for how to do that. And then you just do that across the most common abilities, because it's like that list that I said before, you know, of a lot of abilities. Mm -hmm. You take that list, you remove the ones that are themed or very common, they become magic because they can be their own little themed thing with their own little cool, like, you know, stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then you take the next, you know, most common abilities, codify them, and then fundamentally that's done most of the work for the GM. But then the, the moment you hit the kind of like i don't want to say absolute minimum because it's hardly an absolute minimum the absolute minimum will be good luck um and like an equation right but the moment you reach that minimum of like okay this will cover most cases that a new gm will inquire you stop because the moment you apply too much guidance that it doesn't so much stifle creativity but it stifles what could be an interesting combination and makes the power less of a player's you know, mm -hmm. um, and that's the value of of, of playtesting. I mean, I still can't believe that, you know, 
I hear the horror stories of like certain, you know, Wizards products don't get play tested that much. And it's like, you know, it's design and test. Those are the two important parts. So yeah, there there, there is guidance and like don't get me wrong, I I I can't and don't want to think of every situation. If a player turns up and says, I want a contract which, you know, I touch an object, it turns into buckets. Like, I've got something which is transmutation in the guidance, and then it'd be up to the GM to go from there, really, because you know, fundamentally that's an amazing ability and that's the kind of freedom you want. So yeah. And truth be truth be told, when it comes, I'll, I while I certainly disagree with the whole balance is a necessary attitude that people like John Wick have. Um, at the yeah. same time, um, the um, I do th I do think that to a point, um, exploits should exploits should be encouraged. Um, yeah. Just to, to use a um to use a to use a bit of a video game example, um, there's a there's a term there's a term that's utilized a lot in fighting games called tech. Um, yes. Tech, for those unaware, is is when is for certain techniques or certain um certain tactics that players end up discovering on their own that the that um the designers didn't account for. Um, since Smash has been making all the waves because because of recent announcements, I'll use that as an example. Um, wave dashing. Um, mm. the whole the whole thing of the whole thing of da of dashing downward and being able to and being able to keep the rest of the dash momentum that that was something that happened by accident. Um, the B the BXR exploit back in um back in the days of Halo Two. Um, thing and things and even going even going down to stand to even the combo system that was in Street Fighter 2 that was a total accident yes the whole juggling concept yeah mm -hmm. and well and at the same t at the same time I've seen some I've seen some games like say Overwatch whenever somebody finds some exploit that gives them an advantage it gets patched out in less than a week yeah um one of the, one of the more egregious ones was the bunny hopping exploit that people found out with Mercy and that and by the time by the time I started to see videos about it it had already gotten patched out And this once again comes down to the idea of like playtesting intentionality, because like, because uh, you you want to provide a toolbox and you want to see what players produce. That that that's fundamentally why you bother with a classless system in the first place is expression. Mm -hmm. You don't want things to be unbalanced in the sense that you don't want there to be any obvious ways to break the game or like easy ways to break the game but that's where playtesting comes in because when you play test and a player discovers it, i mean it, it is difficulty because like you know the, the average amount of damage that um is done by like a late game character and donk is about say 40 damage which is a lot you know it's, it's a decent whack of damage right but then at one point i had a player come up to me and say i found a way to do a thousand damage and i was like oh my god what did you do and he said right if the enemy is at half health and i have this quality and i have both these allies buff me and i'm using two of these shotguns with this quality and then and then he proceeds to basically explain to me like this two minute setup that would never occur and say and under those circumstances you can do a thousand damage and I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. Have your thousand damage. <laughs> like, you know, if you can, if you can get the stars to align that much, then great. But it's fine to allow players to break the game, and as you say, have these un un unintended strategies. Just make sure it's not easy. Like, that's it. Like, you're never yeah. gonna make your game fully balanced. Like, you don't want to. <laughs> I re I remember um because I I used to I used to follow a, I used to follow a lot of multiplayer when it came to Halo Two, and I remember um. I remember some people getting really mad at the um, at the BXR and double and double shot um, yes. tactics, but the thing the thing about both of those tactics is you, is um if you do not if you do not have the timing, um, extremely precisely on point, not only are you, not only is it not going to work, but you've just but you've just put yourself in bad positioning and are probably going to die. Yeah. So, so um, in this now, gr now granted, now granted, things like the things like the noob combo where somebody where somebody j goes right outside the bar goes right outside the game's boundaries. That I'm not that I'm not so willing to defend. <laughs> but 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 critically, it, it is a spectrum like this kind of thing because like you know, 
So it, it, again, it is about difficulty because if it if it is e if the BXR was literally easy to do when it became a dominant it, it's it's about a mount if it becomes a dominant strategy then you have to do something about it because at that point it's there's no choice to be made you just reuse the dominant strategy over and over again but that's you know that's about it really like uh game balance is something that absolutely must be strived for because if it's too easy to break your game then it invalidates certain players decisions because they should have just picked the objectively correct one that being said like you know just make sure it's hard to reach those ridiculous points and you know mm -hmm. um to, to to inflate donk's ego like one thing which is good for is the fact that so if you take like um like, like we'll take dnd fifth head or whatever yeah like you know starting levels one and the end level is 20 that's mm -hmm. correct right yeah and at level one you're essentially a fucking peasant <laughs> and like at level 20 you are the demigod of whatever right mm -hmm. um that means that you begin at about five percent your power level right here's the thing though nobody wants to play a fucking peasant absolutely no one like like you, you can find me some people who will say like i'm really into that experience and it's like fine great you guys go into the corner <laughs> and play by yourselves right what people are after is the idea in their head of oh i'll be a level 20 demigod i'll remember being a peasant and the difference will give me euphoria but no one ever reaches that point because no one ever plays level 20 it, it takes like yeah however right. many hundreds of hours right and um when it comes oh, sorry, when it comes to when it comes to the whole thing of oh i i want to play i want to play as a peasant whenever 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 that kind of thing is brought up i u i usually ask what's the last action movie you saw uh and maybe they'll say like maybe they'll say john wick or maybe they'll say rambo or maybe they'll say <laughs> Um and um the Matrix and and I go yeah when's the last when's the last time you saw an a when's the last time you saw an action movie that starred a peasant yeah exactly like n nobody wants to be the fucking peasant like they're they're after a different kind of emotional release but it's not worth it, it because in, it, if if say in a video game you begin as a peasant and then like you know I mean like there are some games where you do that you begin as a peasant and then, oh and then you rise up to become this warrior in a video game that takes three hours in tabletop if say you're doing like a six hour session or whatever and it takes you one session to level up and that's pretty generous right that, that, that's pretty generous like you are looking at 120 hours until you are at your demigod level that is boring that's really boring, right? Meanwhile, in Donk, you know, best game ever, obviously. I'm only going to be hyping it up. But, um, you know, uh, you already start off competent. You, you, you start off as, like, a best-in-class soldier. You start off as, like, a, you know, not world leader, but, like, a world-renowned sort of, like, engineer or, like, a scientist, you know. You st and I, I've done the calculations on the experience points. Um the the you know and and you get 200 experience points across a donk campaign that's what it's designed for right mm -hmm. um but at the beginning of the game you already have 200 xp worth of stuff just in terms of like the free attribute points and the free skills and so on which means you start off at level zero and then you only double in power as opposed to multiply by 20 in power and that makes things a lot easier to plan for because you can anticipate players already being powerful what that means is any exceptional strategies aren't that far away but that also means that simultaneously you can make the gates to accessing them quite high and balance that kind of thing Oh, yeah. But, you know, I don't want players playing peasants, apparently, you know, <laughs> apparently that's something which and needs to be designed for. I know, I know some, I know, um, whenever, whenever I brought, whenever I brought up the whole thing of nobody wants to, pl nobody wants to play a, a peasants, um, I've had, I've had some people bring up, um, the Souls games at, as a, as a rebuttal. But, um, but, but you're not! Like, you're, that's the thing, right? If anyone Dark actually... Souls, you're the chosen undead! Like, like, a, you're, you're, a, you're literally the chosen undead, and B, look at the graphs. You, you gain mo so take the vitality stat. Mm -hmm. Um, the first stat break point in Dark Souls One for your health is twenty. You gain the most health leveling up from whatever you're at to twenty. You get quite powerful quite quickly. You see vapid diminishing returns in that game. They get you powerful quickly. Like you know, it, and in terms of your equipment, it already starts off fairly strong. You just upgrade it to maintain a level with the enemies around around you but mm -hmm. man everyone everyone gets a real like hard on for this kind of thing where they're talking about like oh it's so hard you love being punished it's like no the souls games are just really tight action rpgs that are willing to punish mistakes but there's a reason they give you an estus flask that you can upgrade or that you can get to 10 estus flasks or if you're really struggling you can summon another friend like 
it's not about that. It just isn't. Like the only game I can think of in recent years that was actually starting off a peasant was was it Kingdom Come Deliverance? I think that was the name of it. Um, and but even, even then, even then you're like, even then you're the son of a blacksmith. Yeah, even then you get this awesome sword like fairly early, early on in the game. And to be honest, I also found the game shit. But I understand why some people would like it. But like you know, even then you're only spending a couple of hours as Henry the piss and peasant. You know, compare that to like. I mean, th there's a reason why almost a de facto standard, I've found anyway, across D&D &D campaigns is to start at level 3, because that's when you actually get to make choices, and when you actually get to play someone that doesn't feel horrible to pilot. Like, ugh, let's, I... I let's, also yeah. let's also consider for a moment the hero's journey. And sure. let's, u let's use a, let's use a low-hanging fruit. Let's use, let's use Star Wars Episode Classic. 4. Yep, absolute classic of it, yeah. Luke, te if you want to be real technical, starts out as a as a peasant. Yeah. However, by the however, um by the end by the end of that, that whole that whole pet that whole by the time by the time he's by the time he's effectively Obi Wan Kenobi's um pseudo apprentice akin to akin to a squire for an for an old knight. Yeah, um, that that status of peasant is no longer is no longer applicable since one of the um, one of the key parts of the hero's journey, as laid out by Joseph Campbell, is the call to action. And I know that I know that some I know that some games like Tor like Torchbearer try to do the whole you're ju you're just a bunch of nobodies trying to trying to survive delving into a dungeon you shouldn't be in. But it's shit. <laughs> but he. <laughs> Like, uh, but even then, you're not nobodies. No. Um. As 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 much as much grit as there is in um in war in Warhammer fantasy in Warhammer fantasy roleplay, especially given some of the careers in that one, there's a, there's a built-in understanding that ca that characters are adventurers who aren't exactly cut from the common cloth. Yeah. That doesn't. That does not mean that. That does not mean that they have superhuman amount of amount of power. It's just that there is something different about them compared to everyone else. And that. That's why. That's why I. I, I don't. I can. I feel confident in making the remark that nobody wants to play as a peasant. I know some. I know some yeah. people like to say that in as a as a reaction to high to high powered games, but. Yeah, people but, who say, but you, people who you, say that are just a bunch of hipsters. No, you you want to be you, what, what they want to be is a soldier with chainmail and a sword, you know, like an actual peasant. Where it's like you know, and this is what I talked about earlier, where it's like fa it's weird, where like fantasy, it, you know, in the Lord of the Rings, right, or something like that. You're not following peasants. You are following chosen ones. You're following kings. You're following princes. You're following very important people. Same in Game of Thrones, where you're following nobles for the entire time, right? Okay. Like, the 95% of the population you never see, because their lives are dull as shit. Like, you know... And so many of these, like, D&D-inspired ones or fantasy-inspired ones, just... They're like, oh, we like to have this sort of like medieval setting. No, you don't. Like, like this isn't a medieval setting. This is some high romance stuff, you know. Um, and just saying that we want to feel feel weak. And here, here's the thing: even with like, you know, Luke Skywalker, for example, right? Say, for example, he really, really, really was like absolutely a peasant, which you know he is. He's still handsome, and he's still like you know repairing robots, and you know he's clearly got some kind of hope of being a rebel, right? Mm -hmm. Like we are with Luke the peasant for like fifteen minutes, and then by that time he's practicing with a lightsaber, he's on a gun turret, he's doing all the cool shit, which he's you know mm -hmm. like air quote supposed to do. So yeah, pe people people don't actually want to play a peasant. Yeah. They are just obsessed with this idea of. Starting weak, ending strong, but they never end. <laughs> yeah, and um, there's a there's a couple there's a couple old there's there's when it comes when it comes when it, when it came when it came to that that's why I had that's why I had a fondness for the epic destiny concept that was in um, D and D fourth edition, which I know but I know by I know by by conventional wisdom, I'm supposed to hate with every fiber of my being, but um, dude, I dude, I was raised on D and D fourth ed. Like but, it had some good things, but to, but um, to to that I say, 
One today I say to those listening, leave a comment about how I should about how I should stop liking fourth edition and instead hate it. And all but you know uh, what? Leave, leave I like I like fourth edition. Leave the comment in Russian so that I can't read it. I will I will go so far as say like right. Can I can I make a very brief case go. for what I think fourth ed is good for, right? Go right ahead. So the main reason that people are, are obviously annoyed at fourth ed is because it re it removed a lot of the sort of like narrative bits that were saying you know Pathfinder three point five or whatever, um, and instead focused a lot more on the actual crunch and the combat and the rules and everything. Right. Here's the thing. Everyone is already homebrewing all of their narrative in D and D anyway. It feels like everyone's already making the shit up themselves. Everyone's already like improvising that stuff. And like the thing is, the narrative stuff is a contextual shell for the meaningful decisions the players will make. It's the easy stuff to come up with, right? Which means that there's a certain degree of like, oh no, no, like they've stripped away all of the narrative from the previous games, and it's like, no, they've not. They've just added a lot of, you know, mechanical fidelity, and are kind of just demanding that you come up with the narrative yourself, which you do anyway. Now, I'll absolutely take the argument that, you know, it was too complex. I will absolutely take that, because, the, you know, the way that they had every single ability, like, laboriously detailed, right? But on the other hand, I'll be honest, growing up on it, that kind of showed me how... You know that that that's how you should write your abilities, and then trim it down from there. It's a lot better than having things being way, way, way too vague. You know, so it's like if we consider mechanics and narrative separately, which you shouldn't really, but say that we do, like many people do. Like narrative's the easy stuff. Like you know, I don't to an extent, I don't give a shit if a game like has got specific mechanics around the narrative or specific rules around the narrative because people will make their own up. What I care about is whether or not the engine works. And like, you know, you look at something like say I'll take Fifth Ed, which is definitely an accessible improvement. I won't deny that, but even if you take something like say the advantage disadvantage system, it's lazy and it doesn't work. <laughs> it's also it I also I always found advantage disadvantage to be very spiky. Um of course it is. Of course yeah. um when it comes when it comes to the I um I have I have cr I'm not as I'm not as harsh on 5e as I used to be but I am but I am very harsh on how it's been supported um and cer and certain certain ru certain rules that I think don't get enough hate looking at you um concentration <laughs> yes um which en which ended up making ended up making wizards the worst class to pick um Largely because of the fact that they don't have anything to um, to min to minimize that that concentration issue, pretty much, and it, and it pretty much makes haste a spell that you have to have if you want to be if you want to be useful. Um, but the reason the the reason I bring up the what when it comes to for, when it comes to fourth fourth edition, um, the key thing that I want to bring up here is the is the is the um three arc structure that you had for every 10 levels um you had the the um the um her hero per her um heroic tier paragon tier and epic tier um yes and at the end of the epic t at the epic tier is where you'd get is where you'd get obviously your epic destiny and these were very these were very clearly um o over the top and dramatic in how they're written but in the description of each epic destiny there's a, there's a bit of a note on how you might choose to exit and how and how you could um retire that character af after level 30 and i fin and that i find i find that 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 particular arc um Provide provides a effective end that can that can be utilized instead instead of instead of the whole you start as peasants and you just never and you just never end. Um, there was a similar thing with the Scion trilogy from White Wolf and Onyx Path, where you had three tiers of um, hero, paragon, and eventual eventually um, god. But I'd say I'd say it's. I'd say that's all. I'd say that this is also the reason why um, some why something like Exalted always appealed to me because instead of, instead of trying to justify the whole you start out as peasants attitude, they're like, 
No, we're not we're not doing any of that bullshit. You guys you guys are demigods from the start and you just get more epic as things go on. I respect that. <laughs> it does does it feel a bit sho a bit shown in battle -y? Yeah, but it, but um if you're going to But is it gonna... fun? Like that's the thing. That and that's a game that styles itself as being more mythic fantasy. The kind of yeah. kind of myth that you would see in antiquity. Or the kind of myth, or the kind of mythological insanity you see, you see coming out of India. Yeah. Oh. Oh my God! In Indian mythology is kind of nuts to read <laughs> from a Western perspective, where ninety percent, like, because the thing is, right? There is no David and Goliath in Indian mythology, right? There is no such thing. It is literally, and then this destined superstar hero was fucking incredible and just killed everyone that wasn't him, and it's like, okay. Uh, so what happened to like the person who rose up against the gods? They got instantly destroyed. Have <laughs> it's you, like, oh my god! <laughs> have you ever have you ever read the webcomic Kill Ten Billion Demons? Uh, I have not. No, <laughs> it, sounds it, cool though. It is it is right up that particular alley, and it is completely and utterly fucking nuts. And yeah, you would absolutely <laughs> love it. Um, but when now. One one other one other particular thing that that I was that I was curious about, especially since since you're since we're dealing with a bit with a bit of a tech revolution in um, defenders, and this is again this is going to count as one of my stupid questions. Has anyone approached you about trying to create a gun blade? Uh, yes, on several <laughs> occasions. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, if you've got high logic and high engineering, um, you can fabricate things. And there's a whole research task system, basically, where like you know you can continuously work on projects. And the thing is, we've had stuff that like pushes the limits. Like you know, we've had like people inventing silencers or like sonar or long range radios or things like that. But this is where the magic of the contract system comes in because you can have your superpowers. And so one of the most clever ones has been, okay, my power is um, I can join two otherwise incompatible chemicals or objects, right? So, you know, so I can literally like spot weld wood to metal. Ah, or um, engineering. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, literally, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, power, it's a power by belief. And, like, it will eventually reverse, but it will take a while. Um, and it's a chemical bond, so we'll say that, which means you can have these impossible things. So we've had things like gun blades, or, like, uh, hydraulic fists, or, like, you know, it never gets too ridiculous, you know, like, um, we never had, like, a mech suit or anything like that, but we have just enabled people's fantasies in that regard, and critically, it's fine as long as people are willing to pay for it, because mm -hmm. you have to have the engineering and the logic, and it feels like like your baby at that point. <laughs> yeah, and while while me while a mech might be pushing things, I get the feeling there's been a few instances of um, power armor. Uh, well, pe people have suggested that kind of thing, or like hydraulic fists, and like you know, it's quite big. And like, so the other thing is that you know the the, the players go to fight things in gates, and gate monstrosities exist. That means like there's eldritch materials and living armor, and like those are all big things. Oh yeah, and. I w the other th the fa the fact that there the fact that there is that kind of weapon customization is cer is certainly uh, is certainly appealing because when you think about it the person who's the who who is the weapons guy in fiction they're not going to be using stock weapons no in the in the same in the same way that anybody who anybody who is um inundated in tuner cult in um tuner culture a la, a la anime like like um initial D, which is which is yes, which is where yeah, a lot of people yeah. got exposed to toge racing. Um, absolutely classic anime. Then it's it's while 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 the car may look um stock um outside outside of it, it's not it's not like it it's not like it's gonna be so once you get under the hood. Yeah, and this. And if I if I have to use a Firefly example, consider uh, cons consider Jane's gun Vera, which first, you know it it's I think it's supposed I think it's supposed to be an S a SMG. I, it's hard it's hard to it's hard to tell, but it's completely kit it's completely kitted the hell out. And and clearly a lot of lovers got into it and like mm -hmm. and yeah and, and 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 Donk has that and it's like it's so like given the gun example like you know, there is like the ability to customize guns and also make cartridges for guns and like yeah. you know um, make cartridges that work well with certain spells and like for a certain kind of player being that weapons guy is a big deal you know like it's I it's, it's important I, 
I figure it's only a mat I figure it's only a matter of time before somebody tries to make um Donk's equivalent to the Fat Mac. <laughs> uh well I mean, all, you know what here's the thing all the more power to them because i kind of want people to do that kind of thing right like i, I want people to have their actual fun if if you're not familiar the fat mac is the is the largest sporting rifle ever made that was made at a specific request um yes it was the what is it like it, it was something ridiculous like 0. 0.95 point nine five like inch JD, caliber JD, JDJ. yeah it Which... was something ridiculous <laughs> It's a, it it is a it is a single sh it is a single shot, but it's a, but it's a case of it's is a case of whenever whenever I see that thing, I always end up thinking of that line from the merchant from Resident Evil Four. What do you need that? <laughs> well, go, going hunting for an elephant. Yeah, because <laughs> it was mm. meant to be a hunting rifle, and I and every time I every time I see it, I think, what the fuck are you hunting that you need that? Literally an elephant, one can only imagine. But like, um, I, I mean, sure, people are more than welcome to make that, or just like you know, to essentially make like the quarter fifty caliber rifle. I welcome it, like, because yeah. it's fun and it's meant I've, to be open, and, and it enables all of these things. I've made the noisy cricket at least at least once in in some of my games, so why not? What, what, what's what's the noisy cricket? Um, that was that. T that was. Did you ever see the first Men in Black? Yes, yes, I did. Remember oh, the, the wee, the wee, the gun. Wee that's, gun. That's, as, yes. that's as long as a man's finger, but you, yes. you fire the thing and you'll be, you'll be flying on your ass. Yes, I, I remember that one. Yeah, that's fair enough. Mm -hmm. And um, and you got to welcome that stuff. And yeah. like, man, I do, I do tell you what though, I do hope you like the sound of Donk because like I like I having do. these questions because like I love talking about it. It's it's definitely my favorite game. And like yeah. I tell you what, you're in, you're in on the ground up on this one. Mm -hmm. It's gonna. It's 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 the new hotness. I'm telling you now. <laughs> uh, I just, I am look. A, there's a lot of there's a lot of people who um who try who who try who try and try and put try and put a certain a certain bubble on the on the proper kind of fun. That's the reason the term bad wrong fun became part became part of gaming lexicon. I yeah. have I have always been an ad, I have even even when I even in my earliest days I was always an advocate of. Um, coming up with dumb shit and and finding a way to get away with it. Um, yeah. If someone were to look at my early my early notes when I was playing AD and D, um, it's uh, it's su either surprising or horrifying how much I ripped off of Looney Tunes. <laughs> <laughs> especially since especially since the first one of the first characters I ever did, um, I said I want I want to be a rogue who's very good at making and setting traps. I don't care I don't care about I don't care about um. About picking, about or picking whatever. Lots, yeah, 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 yeah. It was like, I, w I want, I, I'm the kind of guy who wants, who wants to, wants to set up bear traps and then, la then laugh when the bandits um get get their legs chopped off trying to trying to ambush me. Um, of course that led to the infamous up button that I've to that I've told in the past. Um, which short version of that since it was about a year I've told this story before, but the up button was a rune trap that once you stepped on it. You were treated as if you casted fly straight up on yourself for um for six seconds at forty miles per hour, and it okay. Does not... So yeah, a grav lift from Halo. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't. It does not matter. It does not matter how big you are. You go. You go up. And end of the campaign, we end up fighting a dragon. He ends up taking. He ends up taking a st a step forward right on my trap. <laughs> the GM is like. Yeah, but the the drag the that's a huge dragon. You're good. It's too it's too heavy for fly. I didn't. That's not that's not what it says. It says no. anything that steps on the thing flies up. It's like, but we're under but we're underground. I don't care. It's <laughs> there's nothing. I didn't put anything in that sa that says what that says what would happen if there's something in the way. It's meant to go up and nothing else. So um the thing so because of that the dragon ended up getting crushed. Yeah, they're gonna get smushed on the ceiling, and people love that. Mm -hmm. That's what people are playing the games for, right? Yeah. Like, you know, people aren't playing this shit for just like you look. You, have to... you look at yeah. you look at any YouTuber, any um, tabletop YouTuber who tell who tells their who tells their particular stories. It's always the, it's never the story about it's ne the story never never goes. And everything went exactly as planned. And and I said I love how I love it when a plan comes together. That never fucking happens. It is no. always here was the plan, here is how we fucked it up, and here was how we somehow survived our fucking up. 
And it's and it's important to establish your baseline so that way when the wackiness does ensue, you've got something to compare it to. But oh, that's yeah. just it, like you know. But people want the wackiness. Mm-hmm. But I, I say wackiness, like you know, people want the animation. Hit. <laughs> like you know, just I know I'm laboring the point a little bit, but it's like oh, fucking. I, I it, um uh, I, fu- I only... fully endorse I fully endorse that because one, it I it's it's it it, it acknowledges the it acknowledges the way people actually play, and two. I get to I get to make traditionalists mad, so win win. Well, well, this is it, right? Because it's like it's all like good being a traditionalist, and like I'm never going to tell someone to have fun ever, right? Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, if you are the kind of person who is primarily sat around a table and saying, "Forsooth, my dear, I do enjoy staying around the pub," and then well, like, get the fuck away, like I don't want to play with you. Like I am here so that way we can actually do action and things that games are good at, which is you know, games fundamentally are there to represent situations that would otherwise be impossible, right? Mm -hmm. And... Oh. Sorry, I don't know if my microphone is connected there. I can hear you just fine. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I was hearing something in the background. My bad. Um, Sorry, but like... um... You know, so you're using it to represent these situations. And if the situation you want to represent is sitting around the dingy fucking pub and, like, you know, waving down, like, <laughs> waving down, like, well, probably be a tavern wench or something equally, like, sexist or what have you, you know, not interested. Meanwhile, people want the anime shit now. It's like, get with the program. It's no longer, it's no longer the 1980s. Like, you know, it's, it's okay to have a bit of fun. Like, ugh, yeah. Yeah. And with with that with that in mind, um, what would you, I know that there's been there's been a fair bit of play t- there's been a fair bit of um, play testing since the last since the last time I had you on, but a would, lot, yeah. What would you say? Have, what would you say have been some of the lessons that you've learned um, in the process of it? You know, uh, I'd probably say. I mean. Almost the rule zero of this kind of thing is playtest. Good God, if you are making a game, you need to playtest as much as you can, as fast as you can. The moment you have something that is playable, playtest it, because uh, ideas will work in your head, and you will simply not understand why they don't actually work until you play it. You have to playtest, right? Mm -hmm. That being said, uh, if you then are playtesting like a good person, then at that point, um, number one is... Uh, if you ever ask someone for advice, the order in which they, oh, sorry, for feedback, the order in which they give their feedback is just as important as the feedback. Mm-hmm. It, the first thing that pops into someone's mind is the most pressing issue, right? Like that, that's the thing that needs to be addressed first. If somebody can later, like, if you're talking to them, like, you know, actually, now that I think of it, there was also this. That is still important, but it is much less important than someone who's saying this just doesn't work, or like, you know, it's like mm, I just. You know, I just didn't feel like that worked. It it matters a lot more to them than you think. Um, number two is like particularly when it comes to editing and so on. Uh, friends really are useful at the same time. Try and get someone objective, but that's a you know a fairly privileged position if you can actually like afford an editor or afford someone who can actually like you know do the objective kind. Um, and other than that. When you are play testing, one thing which you have to seriously keep in the back of your mind is, you know, say say the objective of play testing is test a mechanic, and then somebody comes up with so 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 an example of one in Donk, which like it seems obvious now in hindsight, it always does, is there were no established rules for what to do if one person wanted to pick up and carry another. Now unconsciousness is a semi common ailment in the game, so at some point it's like oh of course it's going to come up. So consequently you play test and then you decide what the best mechanic for this situation is and then you encode that into the rules because it's the best circumstance. You do not need to do that for everything. If one player turns around and says, yeah, but what happens if I want someone to stand on top of my shoulders, or I want to do a long jump, or I want to do a like um, jump straight standing still? So it doesn't matter. Like, like you know, Don't encode it. Unless it comes up a lot in your game, don't encode it. And like that's one of the most important parts of playtesting as well as realizing if something is not being used, cut it or change it. Mm-hmm. Because if if it's just sitting there, it, it, it's a bit of a fallacy. This thing because like it, there's no such thing as a rule that does not contribute to complexity. If a paragraph of your page is a rule that is never used, then it's not like that thing is harmless. Because whenever someone is trying to find another rule, that adds to the precious amount of time that is you know allotted to them spending time opening up the book and finding the rule you have to get everything as crisp as possible and you know 
That's also a hard lesson, actually, when it comes to um, designing. That's a fair point, which is, um, say you've put your heart and soul into something, and you know it's balanced, and you know it works. Right, you just you just know it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, like like say you've mathematically derived it; it's impossible. If no one's using it, it's a bad mechanic. That sucks. <laughs> like sometimes that really sucks. And a part of that playtesting is if no one is touching something, you have to change it, even if it works perfectly. At that point, it might be a player perception problem, and that you might have to like you know, say for example, re like uh, it might just be a case of rebranding. So like um. In the game, there's water magic, but you can use it on opponents as well to like essentially do blood bending. Um, and a simple name change from water magic to a water slash blood magic was enough to convince people to start using it. Mm -hmm. um, but other times, it's more fundamental. And at that point, uh, then 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 at that point, you just have to go back to the drawing board. And you have to do that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, I'm pretty. It eventually you have to go to the drawing board so much that you may that you may as well um you may you may as well you may as well set up an inflatable bed next to the drawing board or something. Yep, and um, and you'll do that a lot. I mean, it depends on the scope of your project because um, if say for you know like uh, so, so today um, I ended up rereading Thirsty Sword Lesbians, which is a very very good game. Um, but it's trying to represent something fairly small, so it doesn't need that many mechanics. So that's fine. Like you know, uh, you don't need to play test that game as much because there's literally less to test, right? Mm -hmm. If you are planning on doing the stereotypical A4 500 page sort of like game, brilliant, all the more power to you. Uh, it will take an age, and it will take longer to play test, and you're gonna have to bin so many ideas uh, because the more ambition you've got, the more you have to represent, and the more you have to go through, and it takes forever. And, you know, it's, it's it's taken me five years, admittedly. Five years of also like you know finishing my degree, learning to teach, having all sorts of other problems. Um, but it's taken me five years to like scratch this game together, and like the end product is now as standard and polished as it could possibly be. At the same time, what you can never see are the hours and hours and hours of me chucking out thing after thing after thing until eventually it's passable. It just takes forever. Making games is hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, making games is hard. Oh, it, like um, um, it's yeah, it's definitely. Um, I've learned I, if I've learned anything in the last seven years is that game design is an exercise in masochism. Uh, yeah, it, it really is. It's 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 having to open yourself up and like, uh, it, it it's also weird because unlike other creative endeavors where um, say for example you've got like a, a film or a book or a more passive medium, um, you know you can argue to yourself a bit maybe like oh it's subjective. You know, like like it's subjective. If some if playing a game doesn't work, if somebody is not making interesting decisions, ah, uh, <laughs> like that. You know, at that point, it's all on you. So like, it is an exercise in shredding your ego. You know, so uh, yeah, yeah. So but go. with with that said, now you've got now um, as I as I understand it, you're a few days you're a few days away from the from the um Kickstarter. We um, we are three weeks is on the twenty sixth of October yeah, just a just a few day just a few days after spoopy time and, um and ju so so because so because of that you don't have to you don't have to you don't have to do a bunch of Halloween gags when advertising the thing. Uh no, thank God I am I am just slightly before Halloween. Um, in many ways that actually presents. Uh, the that that was the hardest possible deadline because the moment you try and compete with Halloween and it's not a Halloween game, <laughs> so yeah. Mm -hmm. But with all that with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come back up to the temple and enjoy the insanity that happens around here. You're rather welcome. It's it's cool in the temple. As I say, I I love talking about games. It's mm -hmm. um. Uh, half half of the work in making a game, uh, half of the sorry, half of the work in the final product is making a game. Mm -hmm. The other half is um, actually like promoting it and talking about it. And I wish I could just talk about games more, but fundamentally, we're all competing for attention and clicks and minutes and all of that stuff. But you know, it's always a pleasure to be here. And I'm telling you, you're you're in on the ground up here. Like mm -hmm. um, only 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 gets better for Donk. Like. Oh, even if I'm not appreciated during my time. Nah. To be fair, like, uh I Donk Donk is great. 
It really is. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that the fact that it's print medium won't stop people from picking it up because inherently it is a game all about expression. And that means that to an extent people have to get used to it and then play it and then spread via word of mouth. So it may, regardless of where all the Kickstarter goes, I'm confident they'll get, you know, it will certainly pick up in traffic after that. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just fun. It's, It's just a good game. And like, I don't know. I, I, there's a part of me that almost feels the you know of course about the osr and and like all that stuff like it feels like regression in a way a bit when like you know i'd much rather like you know we we actually integrate these lessons and look forward a bit and frankly like just put put the dragon back in the dungeon it's all right like we we can do new things now and like Mm -hmm. my my hope is that this is a pioneer we'll have to see how it goes (laughs) but um i i believe it is anyway but i would say that Mm -hmm. uh as as I often as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Just that. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty mm-hmm, yep, more where cool. that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>